All right, uh, is this thing on here? Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, I was reminded of a few announcements when I got up here, but uh, it might be mentioned later, but we have some flyers here for the gospel meeting coming up on uh, March 20th. If you'd like to take some of those and give them to your neighbors and friends. And then someone told me, don't forget about the time change coming up on Sunday. So you have been announced. There you go. Um, as we, Jason mentioned last time, I'll be doing the teaching now for a quarter or so. And I uh, have some uh, stuff in mind as to what I want to teach, uh, what I want to, you know, teach uh, coming up. But there were some stuff already given to me. Uh, this lesson tonight, we're going to look at this lesson tonight will take about two weeks. I'm expecting spending two weeks on that. You know what? It's been so long since I've done this. It'll take me a while to get my bearings back. But uh, as was mentioned, um, well, it's a long time ago now, but uh, someone had suggested, and so this one tonight, how we got the Bible is kind of by request. And I did a sermon on this about, uh, I think, the end of 2013, so some of the slides you may recognize, but. You know, that's all right to go over some things uh, from time to time again. Repetition, although I've added some stuff to this, so it's not the exact same sermon as it was way back then. Uh, but this is an issue that uh, comes up quite a bit, you know, uh, and really <clears throat> it may have been built on translations, you know, about translations, but I don't have in mind verse by verse comparing each translation and all that. Although I will have some stuff to say by, by way of kind of summary, you know, there are some things that do need, we do need to worry about with translations, but by and large, going through each little, nitpicking each little verse and all that and so forth and so on, we won't do that here. Uh, but we will, what I plan to do is kind of lay a groundwork and so we can understand, you know, how we got the Bible. Because I want to point out that, you know, it was written uh, by the Holy Spirit. Well, actually, we got a slide on that, so I'll just wait for I, till I get there on that. Uh, let me see if I got to do this sometimes. Yeah, okay, how we got the, oh, you know what? Well, let me see. Like I say, it's been a while since I did this. Okay, that's new, all right. All right, well, why study this topic? <clears throat> and so, um, <clears throat> there's some things that come to my mind. I'll put these out here, and if we have some discussion, that'll be okay. Number one, to better understand God's Word. And we do that because God's Word was not originally written in the English language. And it was written in three different languages, of course. Uh, Hebrew, the Old Testament, primarily is Hebrew. There are a few places where Aramaic is used, and Aramaic is um, one of those what they call Semitic languages. And Semitic, you've heard of anti-Semitism and things like that. Uh, that word actually comes from, which I find pretty interesting, you know, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Shem is the one that the Jews came through. And so Semitic comes from Shem, Shemitic or Semitic, as we uh, have anglicized it now. But I think that's pretty cool because it kind of argues for the inspiration of the Bible. You know, where would they even think that, let that, that, you know, Jews came from Shem? You know, well, it goes back to the Bible. But anyway, uh, Aramaic is a Semitic language. And really, it's really the uh, uh, parts of Daniel and parts of uh, uh, Nehemiah, I believe. Uh, those two sections, there's two sections that are written in Aramaic, the rest is Hebrew. And then the New Testament, of course, is written in what's called Koine Greek, and Koine is, is a word for common. It's the same word, uh, koinonia is the Greek word for fellowship, which means having something in common. So Koine Greek is actually common Greek is really what it means. And uh, it was thought to be, at one point, it was thought to be some you know, back in probably 16, 1700s, maybe thought to be some kind of special, weird, Holy Ghost language. Uh, but with lots of discoveries over the centuries, the 17, 1800s especially, uh, we have we found out back then that, coin, that that what the New Testament was written in was not some kind of funky Holy Ghost language. That you know, but it was just a common language of the people of the Greco-Roman world of the first century. And I think there's a tremendous lesson there as well. You know, God wants his word in the common language. He wants the common folk to be able to read his word, to be able to hear his word read. And, of course, in the first century, most people were uh, illiterate. They did, could not read or write for the most part. Uh, and so that's why people would read it publicly. And that's why you have statements like in Revelation 1-3 and elsewhere, Blessed are they that readeth and heareth the, these words and so forth. Uh, and so public reading, but God wants his language or wants his word in the common language of the people. Well, how many languages are there in the world today? I don't even know. Maybe some school teacher types might know that. 
84 spoken in Polk County. There you go. That's just Polk County. And uh, so there's a ton of different languages, and obviously God did not write His, his Word inspiredly uh, in every single language, even of the world in the first century. Or, and of course, the Old Testament was written over a period of uh, probably a thousand years or so, roughly 1500 B.C. to about 500 B.C., 4 or 500 B.C., somewhere in there. Uh, and then the New Testament was written, you know, within the first century, complete within the first century. And so even back then, when God originally wrote His Word through inspired prophets and so forth, even then He didn't write it in every single language available. But what language did He write it to? In. He wrote it in the language of the people he directed it to. And uh, that's another thing we need to know about Scripture, just in general, not just for this lesson, but just in general. Uh, and that is, every, every book in the Bible is written in a certain historical context. And even before I came to preaching school, uh, I was baptized a senior in high school, just been through drug rehab and all that. And then, uh, anyway, I came to preaching school. I baptized in 1982. Uh, yeah, 82. And I was bapt and, I, and I came to preaching school in 89. So that was seven years uh, there. And, of course, I went, you know, I was in Sarasota when I was baptized and moved to Louisiana a short time after that. I was over there for five years. Didn't know it then, but I was hooked up with a pretty liberal congregation back then. I didn't know it back then because I didn't know about that stuff. But, you know, women would lead prayers and chain prayers and all holding hands and singing kumbaya and all that stuff, you know. But, um, but I say all that to say that even before I came to preaching school, just trying to do my best, prepare sermons, and I ended up getting hurt on the job. And I filled in for a little congregation in, uh, in Louisiana. And after about two Sundays, they were between preachers, after about two Sundays, I was out of gas. Uh, man, I got to go to preaching school. I got to do something to learn this Bible. But even back then, I thought, you know, if a person knew the original language, if he knew the historical background, and if he, you know, read, read the Bible and studied the Word, that, that, he would, he, that, that would be tremendously advantageous. And uh, then I came to preaching school and figured out that that's, that's, that was right all along. And so the more we know about the background of these things, the better we can understand God's Word and when we talk, talk about translations, uh, again, since God did not write His Word in English, we'll just use English for example, we have to get it from Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, or whatever we're studying, get that from the original language to something that we can understand. Now, we could all go study Hebrew, we could all go study Aramaic, we could all go study Greek, and then we could read the original documents, okay? Well, we don't have the original documents, we'll get to that in a moment, but we could read it in the original language, but not likely we're going to do all that. I haven't even done all that. I've studied Greek, not even Hebrew, not even Aramaic, but I have studied the book of Hebrews, but that doesn't count for this language stuff, all right? But it'll help us better understand God's Word when we understand where the Bible came from, how, we, how it came to us. You know, how it came from first century, just talking about the New Testament, all the way down to us. But when we look at the, word, the English words that are used to translate the original language, it helps us to better understand God's Word. And, uh, you know, one of the advantages um, of the King James translation is it really forces us to study some of these words. Because, you know, concupiscence, you know, uh, who knows what that means? Well, if you studied the Bible, you would, but when you come across a word like that, Say, well, what does that mean? And my, my, uh, my philosophy, whenever I prepare a Bible class to teach, you know, in a lot of ways, preparing sermons are easier. And, you know, because in sermons, you don't have any people asking you questions till out in the foyer. But out in the foyer, you know, they're usually in a hurry to go out to eat anyway. So, but, um, you know, I, as I prepare a Bible class, I would think, well, if somebody were to ask me about this, how would I answer them? You know, whether it be Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night or whether it be, you know, whatever it might be, if someone were to ask, well, what does this word mean? I got to have an answer for it. So that would cause me to study. And then, but if you, you know, if you, some of the newer translations, which of course there's advantage to those as well, and we'll talk about that as we go along. But, you know, instead of concupiscence, I think it's, uh, some of the translations have evil desire or something like that. Well, if I read evil desire, I'm probably not likely to go do a word study on it because I know what that means, you know, sort of. Um, but concupiscence, you know, maybe not. So, you know, things of that name, but it helps us to better understand uh, God's Word. All right. Secondly, it helps us better appreciate God's Word, at least in my mind. Um, and, uh, you know, what did it take for us to have a translation of the Bible in our own language? You know, people 
got impaled, burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the common language. And I meant to get a slide on all that, but we'll have it for the next time. Um, you know, when you look at a history of translations, people that would even dare to translate the Bible, usually from Latin, because the Roman Catholic Church had a hold on it, and they had it in Latin, and uh, they didn't want the common folk to have access to the Scripture. And that should tell you something about a re religion like that that doesn't want the common folk to have access to understand the Scripture for themselves, because in that, that church and some denominations even today, they want the preacher, they want the pastor, they want the bishop. He's the one that's going to tell you what it means and what to believe. Uh, but that's not the way God intended it at all. Yeah, still is today. And, uh, and, of course, and that's one reason why Latin used to be in all the high schools back in the 50s and before that. Uh, a lot of people, especially up north and in, and in predominantly Catholic areas, had to take Latin as part of their course curriculum because of the influence. Right. It was in Latin until, I think, the 1960s or so when they had some Vatican, whatever, whatever. All right, but it helps me to, to appreciate God's Word. You know, again, people died for it, uh, for translating it and all that stuff. And, you know... Um, only God knows. I doubt that most of those translators, if any of them, would be in heaven. But you have to admire their courage. You have to admire their standing up against the establishment, putting their life on the line uh, to get the word in the language of the common people. All right. Thirdly, why I study this subject? Well, I have there to know the real battles. Um, you know, some battles are worth fighting. Some battles make a difference. But, you know, a lot of people I've seen in, in the history of this study about translations and all that, they, they act as if the whole Christian faith depends upon me accepting a certain translation or rejecting a certain translation, when man, that, that's just so crazy. Um, but there are some real battles to be fought when it comes to some translations of some words and the meanings of them. But, uh, you know, a study like this will help us to realize that, you know, we have an infallible Word of God that was transmitted by fallible people. You know, that Word of God was complete and perfect when it was written. And uh, we'll talk about this as we go along, but they call it the autographs. When, you, when you're in this field of study, they talk about the autographs. Well, the autographs are what they mean by the original book, like, say, the Book of Romans that Paul actually wrote. The autograph. That was perfect. That was perfect, inspired of God, perfect. But when you take that Book of Romans and start translating, when you transmit it down to the different translations... And even if you take that perfect book of Romans in the original language, autograph, even when you copy it to make another manuscript of it, it's done by fallible human beings. And I can attest to this just so much. Uh, well, I guess we'll get into this later. Well, I'll mention it now. We might not get it until next week. But, you know, when you, when, like, for example, when I first went to preaching school, uh, you know, the instructors were not as merciful as I am, and they did not give you handouts. And so most of you went to school where they wrote on the blackboard or whatever, and you had to write notes, take notes. <clears throat> and I don't think students know how to do that now, but anyway, we took notes. And so I would take my handwritten notes, I'd take them home to my wife, and I lived just about a few blocks over this way, Banks Place, right off of Banks Place, and uh, she would type them up for me. And I'd do my best to be as careful as I could to write neatly, and I'd draw circles in different color ink and point arrows over here and leave little notes, do this, do that, and... And even with all that, she would make mistakes, and that's okay, that's okay, because uh, she did a lot better than I could do. Uh, but I see these errors. You know, if you're copying a page, and the last word, or last word on the line is Jesus, and the kids or the dog jump into your lap, or you have to go get the, you know, dinner's burning or whatever, you got to go turn the oven off or the timer off, and you come back to it, and you pick up, well, there's another line down here that ends in Jesus, and you don't realize that, but you should have picked up after this Jesus, but you pick up after this Jesus. So you leave out a whole couple lines, or you may leave out a word. And so that, that is so common that if you ever transcribe somebody's stuff, uh, you know exactly what that's about. And well, that, that happened. We have evidence of that when, when they would copy a perfect, inspired autograph, and they copy it in a, in, in a, just a, exactly as it is and put it over, you know. And then when you put translations in on that, you see, the further and further away you get from the original, the more and more likelihood you can have some mistakes and stuff. And again, there's nothing mistaken, nothing wrong with the autograph, but you have infallible human beings that are transmitting that and even down to us today. 
All right, but this will help us know where the real battles are, you know. Mm -hmm. I have read somewhere, I don't know whether it's incredible or not, that when they did transcribe, if they did count every letter, mm -hmm. count every word, if they didn't match what was on the trans, mm -hmm. the yeah. then they would redo it all. Right, and they would do that. But the problem is, yeah, and the problem is, though, sometimes you may put a different letter in there. Like, for example, if you have... Um, um, like the word, uh, you know, say, uh, well, of course, there's all kinds of words, except for when you put on a spot like this. But if you have a word like, say, from, and you put form, how many of us have done that typing? I mean, we, we've done that all the time. You put the word, you're supposed to type from, but you put from, or for, form, or for becomes fro, you know, which, you know, is all right. Um, and so there's, there's stuff like that you do all the time. And, you know, even before we had spell check and before we had a lot of stuff, I know, um, like, uh, I think uh, I think it may have even been Jeanette Crawford when she was secretary over here at the school when I was there. Uh, so, or somebody like that would tell me that they would, you know, to proofread when they copied something, you know, before Xerox machines and all that, when they would proofread it a lot of times, they would just look at the first letter of a line and the last letter of a line and make sure they were the same and go right on down like that. Well, there's ways you can do that, but even with all that, mistakes can be made. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, my physical therapist, when I blew out my knee, uh, he says, you know, the only difference between, uh, like if you take the word therapist and you put a space between the E and the R, you have the rapist, okay? Well, stuff like that happens all the time. Uh, when you transcribe something, you put a space in there where you shouldn't have or whatever, and, uh, and then to top it off, a lot of times you'd have a master scribe and he would read a line, and then you might have a 20 or so, what do you call them, apprentices or whatever, and they would copy down. Well, suppose he read, it, read one word wrong, and we've done that. If you read aloud to your children, you've read words wrong sometimes. It just happens, you know. And, well, if you do that, now you have 20 errors going out. And then suppose somebody copies that manuscript 20 times, and you see, so errors do creep in. But, again, the autograph is infallible, perfect but it's transmitted by fallible human beings. And then I have one here to avoid arrogance. Uh, and I don't know if I spelled that right, but anyway, ethnocentrism. And that's a word that's, used, that's often used a lot in, in uh, personal evangelism classes or world evangelism, missionary classes. And that, that, that word uh, means uh, that because, you know, because I'm an American, I'm better than anybody else in the world, you know, because of my culture and all that, you know. That's what that has to do with. And uh, some people, you know, and I have there compare with 1 Corinthians 1.12, and that's where Paul said, some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollos, some say I am, I am of Cephas, and some say I am of Christ. Well, people have divided over a translation. You know, I am of KJV, I am of the NIV, I am of New King James, I am of New American Standard, I am of the ESV, you know. And uh, it becomes a, a form of arrogance, at least in, as a way I, I translate all that. And so someone who grew up in the Bible Belt, you know, as, as in the old days, horse and buggy days, and all that was around was the King James, and that's fine, you know, that's fine. I use the King James even now and use it in my whole Christian life until I, start, until I became the, you know, youth man here, okay? <laughs> and uh, so I try to use the new King James when I teach a Bible class back there and all that. But, um, you know... Uh, and the King James is fine, but, the, but we become arrogant when we think, well, if you're not using the King James, then you're some lesser of a Christian, or you're not as bona fide as I am. And I remember one of my first classes over here, well, not my first class, but when I was here at the School of Preaching, we had a guy from New York, uh, you know, and uh, well, he was actually from Trinidad, and he moved to New York as a little bitty baby, and he grew up in New York. Well, what do you think he thought of when he read the word ass, you know, in the King James, or bastard? You know, he didn't think of what, you know, the Bible, if you take that Greek word, you know, donkey or an illegitimate son, uh, that's what those words mean. Well, now, if you grew up on a farm, you had no problem uh, because that's what you called the donkey. <laughs> you might have put the word Jack in front of it, but, you know, I get, and there's a really distinction between those two. But if you grew up on the farm, that, that was nothing. And uh, in old Bible Belt, horse and buggy days, that's, what they, that's how they talked and stuff. And so, you know, that wasn't a big deal. But when you try to teach somebody that's not used to that kind of language, 
And as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, I, I knew a Bible class teacher. She was probably 70 years old or so at one time. And she would always have her kids read, you know, in the Bible class. And they were using a King James. And this one kid read, then he stopped. He couldn't read anymore. He said, Johnny, what's the matter? I can't say that word. That's a bad word. And it was like ass or something like that, you know, donkey. And, uh, you know, but that's, he couldn't do that, you know. So, you know, but, you know, we become arrogant sometimes when we think, well, you have to do, you have to use the translation that I grew up with or else you're some kind of liberal, flaming liberal or something, you know. And so uh, a study like this will help us to realize that every translation has its strengths and its weaknesses. And there is no such thing, I'll say right here, as a perfect translation, okay? Now, some are a lot better than others. There's no doubt about that. But uh, no such thing as a perfect translation. All right, now, well, actually, any questions or comments? Or is there anything else you'd like to add to that, maybe? Uh, why study this, this topic? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And with the computers, you can do that. It's great with the computers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And so it would be better to have a translate, to force a translation on somebody that they can't read, or at least can't read in good conscience, or would it be better to put that, put that Bible in, in a language that they can read, that's still accurate, and you know. And that, you know, is, so you see the point on that, all right? But uh, anyway, it can lead to arrogancy uh, and all that. All right? Go ahead, Frank. How do you feel about uh, using different translations as it relates to your private study? Oh, I'm all for it if you have the time and stuff, yeah. Yeah, um, like like when I when I teach the gospel to somebody, like if I'm doing a personal personal study, I like to use whatever Bible they have, even if it's an NIV, and I'll point things out in that, you know, because I don't want them to think that they have to have my Bible, because if they think they have to have my Bible to understand the church, they're going to think it's my church, and I found it's a lot lot more helpful if you use their. In fact, let them read from their Bible, like you know. Like turn to Matthew 16, for example. Go ahead and read that. You know, it gets him involved in the study and so forth. But, it, but uh, you know, if I know ahead of time what Bible he has, I will compare that and, and so forth and, uh, and like that. But uh, so far as personal study, <clears throat> like when I'm putting together notes for the school of preaching, I, I have, you know, kind of like what Faith says, well, I have five translations up there that I compare with, five translations. And, of course, with the computers, it's so easy to do that. Because, you know, before I used to have Bibles open here. You know, I could fill up a desk like this. This side, just all Bibles open and commentaries open and all that. But the computer, you have it all right there. And uh, right there in a little, you know, eight by nine square. But, uh, you know, I use, yeah. Because I don't want people to think they have to use my Bible or my translation. Uh, now, of course, of course, now I, you know, I, I know some of the errors in the NIV and so forth, and, uh, and I can point those out as we go along. But the way you point them out is even in their own Bible, because you compare that passage with this passage, and even in their own Bible, there'll be the contradiction there. And then you can bring in some other things like that. And as a matter of fact, um, I heard a preacher talk about it somewhere recently about, um, oh yeah, it was, uh, I believe it was, uh, well, one of our teachers uh, but if you take like the, the uh, Jehovah, the New World Translation, you know, the Jehovah's Witness has their own translation, you know, okay, and there you go. You have to have that to understand their doctrine because this one doesn't teach their doctrine, but theirs does. And so you, that should be a red flag, you know. And, but I don't want people to think that about us. You know, you got to use my translation. But anyway, he, uh, he pointed out, and I think he had it at a, at a computer there. He says, you know, here's this translation uses this word, this translation uses this word, this translation uses this word, and this one is the only one that uses this whacked out word, you know? And so you, you can even show like that in a comparison, but um, so far as personal study, 
I would try to get myself as familiar as possible with whatever translation they're using, especially the passages that I would use a lot like Acts 2 or Matthew 16 or, you know, Mark 16, 15 and 16, those passages, see how they read and all that. But, uh, but you know, it, it only helps your study the more translations you look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially a younger person. Right. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, we have it from God to inspired writers. Now, these are some passages that we're all familiar with. And again, as it came from God, it was perfect, infallible, inerrant, and all those. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Okay. And so there, all Scripture is inspired of God. And you've heard me say this in sermons, and Bob as well. But that word, uh, given by inspiration of God. Five English words comes from one Greek word that literally means God breathed. God breathed. It has the word for God. It has the word for spirit or breathed in it. Theopneusis or something like that. But it means God breathed. And some of the translations even have it. I believe the ESV right there. Um, somebody has the ESV in 2 Timothy 3.16. Breathed out by God, I think is how they translate that. Is that right? Breathed out. He's got it on the computer there. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And that's really, really literal. Breathed out by God. Uh, it comes from God. All right? And the fact that it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. That's all we need right there is the Word of God to furnish us, us completely unto every good work. All right, 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. Oh, yeah, i got to tell you this now. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I did a lesson similar to this on, um, eh, about a couple years ago, and people were offended that I would say the three-letter A word for donkey and have a letter B word for illegitimate son, you know, which I thought was pretty inconsistent, you know, because, you know, it's right there in the King James Bible that they use all the time. So I didn't mean to offend anybody if I use those words, you know, but that's the way, you know, that's just, that's just me and that's the way it is. So I hope no, no offense was taken there. All right. Uh, but Second Peter 1, 19 through uh, 21 there. And so we, uh, and this is New King James here, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as the light shines in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All right, now that private interpretation of what this passage is saying is that no prophecy originated from some prophet's own private, what he thought about it. Okay, it did not come from what the prophet himself thought about it, but it came from God. And if you also notice here in verse 21, for the prophecy came not by, notice the by the will of man versus at the end of that verse, by the Holy Spirit. All right, no prophecy came by or never well new king james for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit and so again the autographs the originals uh, they were not from the you know the the mind of man but they were by the will of will of god through the holy by the by the holy spirit i should say 
And then also, and you've probably heard me say this in a few sermons or so, but in verse 21, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That word moved is a kind of a nautical terminology when the wind fills the sails of a ship, of a vessel. And you know, when that, those sails get put out there, and then the, you know, those sails just come big puffy with the wind blowing them, moved along or borne along, some translations may have. Uh, but the Holy Spirit moved them along like that in inspiring them, in this case, to write these prophecies of Scripture. And so again, that's talking about the autograph, you know, from God uh, to the inspired writer. So God's part, again, is infallible, it's perfect, inerrant, it's the Word of God. And then this other passage here in John 16, 13. John 16, 13. And he is talking to the apostles here. And uh, he does mention here, and this is in this section, uh, you know, it's often called the comforter section or the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, uh, as that word comforter is used throughout. But here he says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Okay? Uh, he will guide you into all truth. All right? Now, this has already happened. It's, it's, this is past history to us. It was future when he spoke these words to the apostles. Uh, in fact, if you go up there to verse, um, verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And, um, you know, he has not yet departed. Um, if you look at verse 7, look at verse 7, John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And so, in other words, while Jesus was still upon the earth, uh, the Holy Spirit would not come to them. So he's saying it's to your advantage that I go back to the Father so that then I can send the Holy Spirit with you who will guide you into all truth. And of course we see this being played out through the book of Acts and so forth. And, and again, um, you know, there's two, two both acceptable ideas of when inspiration ended. You know, some would say in A.D. 70, the last book of the Bible was written, Revelation. Uh, some would say A.D. 96, the last book of the Bible was written, Revelation. And again, there can be some discussion on between the dates of the book of Revelation. But we can for sure say by the end of the first century, the New Testament was complete. That is the autographs, the original autographs of the Bible. All right. Uh, but, you know, God's part, again, is perfect. It's infallible. It's inerrant. The Word of God. Uh, however, it was transmitted by the hands of men. And so from the inspired writers, it came down to us today. And, um, mm -hmm. Right. The old King James. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And as uh, Faith was talking about Easter, you know, Easter is in, in the King James Bible. I believe it's Acts 12, 4, I think it is, something like that. Uh, Easter, which of course is a mistranslation, totally mistranslation. Um, no justification for that translation at all. Uh, and the other translations have there, I think, Passover is the actual Greek word there, Passover. But again, King James and Easter and all that stuff. Uh, but we'll probably talk about, well, in fact, I do have a slide that mentions that later uh, on the groundwork. And so, you know, even the King James has its, you know, weaknesses, but again, still a good translation. And so, as I said before, every translation has its strengths and weaknesses to it. All right. But uh, from the inspired writers to us, that's where the, the things can happen. All right, now this timeline is my typical timeline, and those of you, none of you in here, though, I don't think have been my full-time students before, but this is almost in every one of my classes. I write this on the board several times a week. Uh, this just puts history in perspective. You know, history, uh, time had a beginning, <clears throat> Genesis 1-1. 
time will have an end on Judgment Day. And in between that, beginning and end, and this is not to scale, this is not to say that we're going to last another million years or something, but, um, you know, there's God called a special people to Israel out, and he sent his son Jesus to die upon a cross. All right, now if we take that timeline, and, um, you know, some important dates here, so far as the Bible's concerned, I have there, and we're just going to basically from here, we're just going to confine ourselves to the New Testament, which, by the way, I want to mention this. And the new, we have more evidence. We have more. We have a better, better understanding of how the New Testament came down to us than we do the Old Testament. And one of the reasons why is because you had a group of scribes that uh, um, Jim mentioned here were among other scribes as well. And you can't fault their attitude. They were so meticulous. They did not. They were so respectful of the Word of God. And by the way, they're the same scribes that would not write Jehovah in there or Yahweh. They would put a different word for God, which will be another one of our studies before we get into something else. They would put a different word of God in there, Adonai, because they were afraid that they would use, they didn't, they didn't want to use the Lord's name in vain. So they didn't even, they didn't even copy it into their, their manuscripts. Um, but this same group of scribes, whenever they would come, if, if a manuscript became tattered or worn or something, they would recopy it and throw it away. Well, you know, that's good. You know, they wanted to keep the, keep the scroll and the synagogues and all that looking good, looking fine, because they didn't want people to dis, you know, look like they were disrespecting it. Well, the bad thing about that is sometimes that these, these manuscripts and these translations and so forth, they would have little notes that were written in there. You know, like, why did they use this Greek word and not another Greek word? Sometimes they would write that in there, why they did that what evidence they had, you know, what manuscripts they copied it from and so forth. Well, when they would re redo it, they wouldn't always put that little marginal thing in there because by the time they redid it, they, are, they already knew that. And I've compared it to this, you know, in one of my Bibles, the first Bible I had that I came to preaching school with, I had a lot of notes and stuff written on the side of the margin. You know, stuff circled, pointing back here and all that. Well, over the years, I've preached and I've taught that so much in personal Bible studies and sermons and, and so forth that I no longer needed those little circles, and I no longer needed those cross-references because I already knew it. So when I bought a new Bible, guess what? I didn't rewrite those little things in. And now some stuff I did rewrite. Some passages and so forth I would rewrite, but some stuff I didn't. And let's just say Acts 2, for example. Suppose I had a bunch of stuff written on Acts 2.38, a bunch of cross-references and so forth. Then I get a new Bible. I preached and taught that so much I don't need that anymore. I get a new Bible. I don't re rewrite that in there. And then suppose I give that Bible to somebody and they say, well, look, he never preached on Acts 2.38. No, that's not necessarily the case. I did. I just didn't need those notes. And so that would happen a lot of times with these, with, with these manuscripts and these ancient translations before the printing press came along. And so those notes are real valuable in a study like this, but they didn't see the value in, in rescribing those notes as they would make another copy. And so that's what happened to the, a lot of the Old Testament, uh, that they would recopy and destroy it. We wouldn't have those notes. But in the New Testament, though, with some of the debates and so forth that took place, we have a lot better record of how it came down to us. And so this primarily is in reference to the New Testament. All right. And so anyway, AD, AD 100 was the original uh, books uh, were written. And again, those were called the autographs in the literature and so forth. And again, you know, by the end of the first century, they were all written. And uh, by the way, I guess I will put some, some of this in here later. I don't have it here, but the 27-book canon has always been the 27-book canon, even though it may not have been officially recognized until uh, 325, I think, something like that. And the, uh, the Mormons will jump all over, over you on this because they'll say, you know, the King James Bible wasn't completed until 325. Well, no, no, that's when a guy named Anathasius, uh, that's when he, uh, his canon, you know, because we, throughout the history here, we have different people had their, their canon. You know, here's the books that they consider were inspired and so forth. And some of them, you know, like Marcion, who was known as a heretic, he only had the, um, most of the epistles of Paul, with the exception of the pastorials, and the Gospel of Luke. Everything else he, he, didn't, he didn't acknowledge. And so but what I'm saying here is these, we have always had these books. They've always been the canon. 
which means the standard, uh, even though some, some scribe didn't, didn't recognize those as such until you know, 327 or 325, somewhere like that. But I'll, I'll say something about that later. I'll make sure I make a point of that. Um, but, you know, God has always had a standard. And so we have it here. Well, I believe that's the second bell. So we'll pick up. I'll try to freeze brain myself right there and pick up on that same spot uh, next time we meet. I'll put it that way. Pending the announcements tonight. All right. Appreciate your attention.